Well, thank you everyone for coming this morning uh, to our event on future vertical lift. Uh, and I want to begin, uh, first of all, with a security announcement, which we need to do just in case. It's never been an incident, and it's a very secure facility, but if there were to be an incident, uh, there is an exit in the back, and there's an exit out the, uh, the way that you came in, and uh, I will be the security officer who will provide direction in the event that we need to, to leave the room. But uh, chances of that happening are very small, uh, and hopefully not something that we'll have to worry about. Uh, let me begin by mentioning that this, uh, this event is part of a series uh, on uh, future uh, aviation technologies, uh, and particularly those applicable to ground forces, part of a ground forces dialogue. And as many of you probably know, Dr. Marin Lead really began this series of events and has been leading it. Uh, she has uh, seen fit to return to the Department of Defense uh, and uh, actually to the Department of Navy. Um, to uh, uh, help advise some of the leaders there on their, on their important tasks. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to be uh, picking up the mantle on this discussion, and we have uh, a couple of uh, future events in addition to this event that we'll be having on, on this topic and on these discussions. Um, and so the great work that's been done on this already by, uh, by Maran is going to be continued and carried forward. Uh, by the group that's uh, uh, continuing to work on it here at CSIS. Well, let me start uh, today's event by talking a little bit about, uh, about the future vertical lift uh, and the consortium that's been put together. And, and we have uh, Nick Lapos from the consortium here today to talk about it and Jim Kelly from ATNL uh, and talk about how this fits into the overall picture of what's happening uh, in technology at DOD and in the discussions that are underway. And so, uh, as has been noted in the past, particularly by me and, and future events some of you may have heard, uh, technology and the future of technology is really critical to the national security strategy and to the defense uh, strategic guidance and to uh, the DOD strategy as laid out on the QDR. And uh, fundamentally, as has been noted uh, many times frequently by uh, then USD 18L, now Secretary Ash Carter. Uh, we know that the capabilities, the technological capabilities that the Department of Defense uh, relies upon for its strategy aren't produced within the department, they're produced by industry. And so it's the dialogue between DOD and industry, the partnership uh, and the cooperative efforts of both uh, that makes the strategy work uh, and will make the strategy work in the future. Uh, and so I think what we have today is, is really uh, an interesting and a critical example of how that dialogue actually takes place and what it actually brings to the table, how it informs the future of the department. Uh, so uh, with future vertical lift, uh, there is right now a dialogue going on between within the Department of Defense, uh, between the military services, but critically also uh, between the Department of Defense and industry. Uh, and many times, those of us who follow the acquisition world, you get to a certain point and you say to yourself, how did we get here? You know, whose idea was it to do things this way? Uh, did anyone talk to industry? Did anyone ask industry when they came up with this plan, with this path forward, uh, whether this was the right way to go, whether we were truly accessing the best of technology? Did we overlook something that was available? Did we, did we move too soon when better technology was just right around the corner? Uh, are we accessing what industry has to offer in the best way? You, you almost always reach that point at some point in acquisition program and you think about the paths you didn't take. Uh, and, and something that most people walk away from when they go through those moments is, boy, that early dialogue between the Department of Defense and industry about what's really possible, what's really in the art of the doable, what are the smart ways to think about these problems, that early dialogue is a key factor in success going forward. Uh, and what's nice about the Future Vertical Lift Consortium is it has provided uh, a venue for that dialogue between DOD uh, and industry. Now, there's a lot going on in the world of Future Vertical Lift um, in addition to the dialogue that's happening vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the consortium. Uh, there are, uh, there's an Army demonstration program going on on vertical lift technologies. There's a DARPA uh, demonstration effort going on. Uh, there are various S&T efforts undertaken by, uh, by the services, particularly the Army, in the vertical lift area. So there's quite a bit going on. Uh, but where, what I think the key differentiation or the key thing that's happening with the future vertical lift consortium that we'll hear about today 
is really that dialogue on concepts, requirements, the art of the possible, and technology, uh, and how future vertical lift can play in potentially new and different ways in the future, and not just reiterate what it's done in the past and make marginal improvements, although marginal improvements may be, may be useful and may be the path ultimately selected. Uh, and that dialogue is critical at the time when the Department of Defense is thinking about and working on the Defense Innovation Initiative and Betting Firing Power 3.0 and trying to identify the technological advances that are going to be really the key differentiators in future warfare. Um, now, uh, I think we'll hear more from uh, Nick and on what the dialogue of the Future Vertical Lift Consortium uh, is really pointing towards what kinds of things have been identified in this conversation within industry, within the department, and between the two. Uh, and where the ultimate gains are likely to lie. And I think, from what I understand, uh, one of the uh, ideas and concepts that has really jumped, uh, jumped uh, to the fore has been the issue of commonality. Uh, and I'm not going to go into great detail about uh, what that's going to be, because there are smarter people here to tell you about that, uh, to tell you about what they see as the potential for commonality and what they see as lessons learned on prior efforts uh, in, uh, to do uh, things in a more common way, some of which have been very successful, some of which have been less successful. Um, so uh, with that brief introduction, I am going to introduce the first of our two speakers, uh, Nick Lapos, who is the chairman of the Future Vertical Lift Consortium uh, uh, and has been leading, uh, actually served as the chairman uh, in a prior term and then took a break and then came back and has been the chairman, I think, since 2012. That's correct. Uh, helping to lead uh, that dialogue and those efforts. Uh, in his day job, he uh, works for Sikorsky Aircraft as Senior Technical Fellow for Advanced Technology. Um, he previously uh, d uh, began his, I guess you would say, began his career in the United States Army uh, and was a uh, attack helicopter pilot uh, in, uh, in Vietnam and, and no doubt in other, with other service. Uh, joined Sikorsky in 1973 uh, was program director for the S-92 helicopter, so knows a thing or two about bringing a product from concept to fruition uh, and, and a successful product that's out there in the world. Uh, the program under his leadership earned the Collier Trophy, which is uh, quite an achievement. Um, and he has been a test pilot, uh, and I thought the most interesting thing on his resume, holds 18 pat uh, patents and three helicopter world speed records. So. Uh, uh, he's, he's really the full package. Thank you for coming today, Nick, and uh, we we'll look forward to your comments. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, and of course, uh, helicopter world speed records uh, are roughly the taxi speed of an F-35. <laughs> Recommend that. Thank you very much and good morning. Um, I'd like to uh, divide what I'm talking about into two general sections. One is uh, an introduction to the Vertical Lift Consortium, and then to answer some questions that were asked of us by the Council of Colonels for the Future Vertical Lift, and that were reported to the Executive Steering Group. Uh, and the questions had to do with such things as, what about requirements? What about acquisition? What can we change? What about commonality? Uh, so let me uh, go through these slides in a little bit of, uh, of uh, that order, just first for the, the Vertical Lift Consortium. Um, our mission is basically to serve as a conduit for a uh, pre-competitive information exchange and for um, work that's done on a research uh, phase with our government customers. And we do represent about uh, uh, 65 or so companies in the vertical lift industry. Most of the companies who are the key players in vertical industry are part of the, uh, the, the vertical lift consortium. Um, we were formed so that we could have a single voice and we could speak with that voice. Uh, we're a 501c organization. Uh, we do go for consensus, but every report that we pass in also has the minority reports of any outliers so that the, the unwashed opinions of the vertical lift industry are presented to our customer. Um, we do have in our vision is to try as much as we can to support our customer and to create better tools for our warfighters in the future. That is very important to us. Most of the members of the consortium who represent the, 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 their companies in the consortium are former military. This is a uh, description of who is the 
vertical lift consortium. And you can see that the, if you look at the size of the industry and recognize that 66 companies that represent this, uh, represent the bulk of the work that's being done to develop and field today's production machines and future machines. Uh, so we are a voice of industry. We represent the ability to do collaborative projects and we have the ability to work through a, an OTA, that means a rather rapid uh, contracting capability so that work can be done relatively quickly. And we're finding now that we're beginning to pick up traction in terms of doing research work into the longer future. And we have uh, a competitive posture as well, so members within the consortium compete with each other for those uh, the revenues that have to do with doing research. Now the uh, future vertical lift Council of Colonels asked us to answer some questions that had to do with the, the questions about what can we do with acquisition? Are there any changes that could be recommended from the industry outward? Uh, what about uh, commonality? What are the concepts that the industry thinks could be uh, approached with commonality? And then how about requirements? Can you tell us about that as well? So this represents the distilled thoughts of the industry back to the Council of Colonels and the Executive Steering Group. First, we would say for acquisition, we have to recognize we've enjoyed a tremendous advantage. Our combat systems around the world are unparalleled. Uh, and we think that today's system therefore works well. But there is a question for us that has to do with the development timelines for today's systems. And uh, we reported back that the timeline to develop a full system and pro put it into the field is probably about as long as the shelf life of that system. We have to be concerned then with the idea that if we're talking now about concepts that will not be filled until 2034 or 2035, will they be viable concepts then? And so what could be done to shrink acquisition timelines? Um, we think that there's a great deal that can, uh, time that can be taken out of these timelines, but they have to do uh, very much with the idea of teamwork. I'm not gonna read the slide to you, but basically point out that there are ways of running programs and running organizations that have to do with concurrence and have to do with teamwork. Um, many of us in the consortium are familiar with Kelly Johnson's rules and recognize how programs might be run. And many of us are also students of World War II history where we had no other choice. And so programs were often run by having the military uh, procurement organizations, the contractors, and the users work as a team together and build products that were fielded in months, not years. And we think that that kind of, of uh, uh, speed can be put into the system again. We think there's some uh, actual concepts of it that are available today. We have to recognize that uh, such systems as the 787 or the Sikorsky S92 or the Bell 525 can be designed, built, tested, fielded, and change their operator's environment in a period of about one half the time of a DOD, typical DOD program that goes to IOC. So we have to ask ourselves, if we were to use a benchmark of a 787, how could we then take that kind of a program and mirror it into a DOD program to save the time that it takes, and therefore to put these uh, devices into the warfighter's hands earlier, but something else as well, time is money, and a marching program spends by the day. So if we get systems out into the field, we believe it will also have a significant cost savings as well. So we look at the acquisition strategies. We recommended as well that uh, the cost of systems is very much driven today by initial cost, recurring cost, but there's also life cycle cost. And we believe that if you, if you consider the amount of money that it takes to keep our systems fielded and operating, um, we have to recognize that life cycle cost is a very much a, a distinct measurable and a very important piece of the pie. We also think that, uh, that uh, when we do that, it will change our procurement strategies to some degree. It'll change our design strategies to some degree, and that should lead to a, uh, better products in the field. Uh, generally speaking, cost to operate is directly associated with the, the maintenance cycle and to the time spent in maintenance, and therefore we think that, that uh, looking for life cycle cost advantages might grow and lead to systems that are more durable and more persistent in the battlefield. And how might the government organize? We think that uh, this uh, acquisition is tied directly to commonality. I won't spend time on this slide, but show you in the next slide. We believe that a nested program of programs might be the way to go. And that is that we would end up having a, a, a system that could produce the common elements that are used by all of the capability sets for future vertical lift. And those common elements are produced by its own program and delivered as deliverables. Uh, we also think that the Skunk Works approach, as I mentioned before, is a very important uh, 
uh, concept to consider. And we have to recognize the oversight requirements and the procurement laws that there are. And we have to protect ourselves, all of us, as a taxpayer's money is spent well and wisely. But we think that that can be done, and we think the contractors can help to, to make that occur. And we're ready to collaborate to, as an industry to try and create this, uh, this future system. In terms of commonality, we picture this. And this is, this is uh, um, with no dissenters within the industry on this. And that is that we would have a system that would be fielded, but would have common elements that were produced separately. If you could picture, is there a reason why every flying machine has to have a cockpit design team to design that cockpit? And every flying machine has to have generator control units that put on the generators, hydraulic elements that are designed separately. It's amazing how uncommon today's systems are to the point where if you open the maintenance manuals on two Army helicopters made by different manufacturers in different programs, they use different words to describe the ship systems. So the maintainers have to learn a different vocabulary to move from aircraft A to aircraft B. So if you think about that, maybe we could produce, if you will, a series of programs that develop the elements of each of these programs that they share, such things as a training and currency systems such things as the crew stations and cockpits, all relatively identical or at least common. And that maybe a ship system that would drop torpedoes would be different than one that would launch anti-tank missiles. But those would be hung on the outside of a cockpit that otherwise would be identical. And maybe even so that different engines had different limits. But the crew had a limit gauge that was labeled in percent. And the colors and the concepts of those percent of, uh, of limits were the same basic concepts. So the crews did not have to learn a new language and a new way of thinking to move from machine A to machine B. Now these elements are already had in the world today. If you have a Penske truck and you drive into a U-Haul dealership and they change the starter, do they have to look in the book? We already know that most of the systems we deal with have elements of commonality that are driven by, by the fundamentals of economics and by the fundamentals of it's a good enough way to go. We have to recognize that these systems that we're talking about that have become common do erode to some degree the payload of the system that they go into because there is a natural price to pay for being slightly less than perfectly optimal. The ideal cockpit in one machine is not the ideal cockpit in another one. So there'll be some trade-offs to be made and some biting of the bullets by the project pilots and by the program managers to accept a system that comes from the cockpit program management team and is presented to the team and says, this is your cockpit. And of course, there has to be the elements of the cockpit that then serve the aircraft it's put into, which modify it. So modifiability has to be built into it as well. I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but I must point out that we think the commonality goes all the way back to the point where the maintainers have the same basic troubleshooting charts, the same basic troubleshooting procedures, and it is not a strange thing to open up a page in the maintenance, electronic maintenance manual and read that maintenance manual for aircraft A as opposed to aircraft B and find that they are roughly the same and that it didn't take a total retrain to use that system. And this is another way to say roughly the same thing. And, and please note that their basic system design, even so much as to, is to standardize the hardware and tool sets, even so much as to have the same basic hydraulic and electrical connection systems that were all fundamentally the same. It seems radical today, but go on eBay and look for a World War II turn needle as a cockpit display and find out that that turn needle was used in seven or eight different aircraft, the same part number. So we find that in the past, we didn't have the luxury of standardizing each aircraft to itself only. And when we don't have that luxury, perhaps we gain advantages in costs in, in the, in the uh, commonality. <clears throat> Some of the pitfalls, of course, or what do we do about the fact that there will be one design that's licensed across the board? So there's lots of business interaction that will take place because of this, and lots of tracking of the intellectual property that exists there. But uh, this, again, are bridges we've crossed in the past. Um, we have to recognize, too, that uh, um, the, all the data and data rights question will have to be solved. Uh, we, uh, we stand ready to discuss this fully and, and try and help work that out. We have to recognize that uh, the industrial base is an issue, too. If there's only one fundamental cockpit design, who does that design? And where does it reside? And who else loses or atrophies their ability to make those systems? Lots of uh, ideas of single point failures as well. If everything is quite common that way, what if we discover a flaw in the way a hydraulic system works? Does every aircraft get grounded because of that flaw? So we have to build resilience in as well. 
and it's very similar to what farmers face when everyone buys the same strain of corn. Lots of, lots of things to think about for this. Uh, there are also some other commonality questions. If we are talking about building logistic systems that are virtually identical for the various future vertical lift capabilities, does that mean then that the services change the logistic system fit? Or do these adapt into the services logistic system? A big question to ask and, and a lot of uh, rippling that'll flow back into each of the services. So we have lots and lots of uh, work to do there. Requirements, recommendations, uh, lots of words here. They can be read afterward, and please enjoy yourself with them. Uh, the fundamentals of this, we think that nothing is a requirement until it proves itself through operations analysis and good solid science and good solid field practice. So we have to be very careful about declaring requirements until they prove themselves. And it's, it's very difficult for us to be able to weigh which is worth more, 40 miles more range or two more missiles, 40 miles more range or one half hour more hover capability. We're not sure which one is more valuable. And we have to be very careful before we weigh and recognize that when we weigh one against another, one takes from another. The volume, if you will, that defines the design of an air vehicle is a fixed volume. And if we make one thing better, something else has to be made worse. I, I often describe that the volume that is a design is like a soccer ball. And if you write on the face of the soccer ball, hover performance, high speed, range, each face has a different word on it. If you make that face better by pulling it out, other faces have to go in, so the volume stays roughly the same. And we have to recognize then that balancing requirements is very much balancing so that we get the best combat power in the warfighter's hands. And we do not seek parity with uh, threat forces. We have to seek solid advantage with threat forces at all times. I have a saying that's on the internet, and you're free to look it up, and that is if you're in a fair fight, you didn't plan it properly. So uh, bottom line is that we're here to help. Um, one of the ways we think we can help is to point out that today, if you were to go into the desert, you discover that the war is being fought to a great degree with dependence upon rotorcraft to support the warfighter. There are observation posts and, and places that are being fought at that cannot be accessed other than by rotorcraft. Uh, introducing the tilt rotor to int introduce more range and speed has changed that battle even further. And what we're talking about with this slide is let us not talk necessarily uh, about replacing today's battalions with tomorrow's battalions. Let's talk about whether or not it's time to think about rotorcraft changing the battlefield enough so that today's missions that are done by ground units could be done tomorrow by aviation units. And think about the fact that if you run supplies up a road, and a truck moves at eight or 10 miles an hour in contested territory, the truck has to have its own fuel and its own people and its own protection. And then when it goes 100 miles, it has to stop and be protected overnight and then go out again. And the actual cost to get the bullet to the end of that truck's line, 250 miles from the uh, port city, to get that bullet out there, how many bullets did it take? And it's sort of like, if you can picture this, the moon mission put 30,000 pound flight vehicle on the moon and weighed six and a half million pounds at takeoff. So what is the weight of the system that gets that bullet to the last person on the end of the line? And we believe that rotorcraft vertical lift machines can be a very essential tool at reducing the total amount of tail to get that tip where it needs to go. So we invite us all to look at future missions and change the mission structure as necessary. This same slide could have been used in 1937 to talk about the difference between aircraft carriers and battleships. It could have been used in 1932 or 33 as the difference between troops that walked and tanks that rolled. The warfare uh, changes with technological advantage, and we believe that vertical lift has got the sustainability and battle hardness now to be a fighting member of the force and perhaps to be counted on even further. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. And our next speaker is uh, Mr. James Kelly, goes by Jim. Uh, Jim, in his day job, leads the F-35 logistics team in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Logistics and Material Readiness. Uh, I think I've heard of that guy. What's his name? Uh, that would be Mr. Berteau. Berteau, <laughs> yes. We have heard of him. Uh, congratulations to you for acquiring David Thank from you. us. Um, uh, he advises the, uh, the Assistant Secretary on all aspects of sustainment for the F-35, but he's here today in a different capacity, uh, an older capacity for him because he 
uh, began life as a U.S. Army attack helicopter pilot. Uh, he was a veteran of the first Gulf War and the Bosnia campaign. Uh, and he uh, served a number of positions uh, in the G4 of the Army uh, uh, in logistics capacity and within uh, the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition Logistics and Technology uh, in their aviation systems uh, area. Uh, he has a Master's of Science in National Resource Strategy from ICAF uh, and also a Master's in Public Administration because it, if one Master's is good, two must be better. <laughs> Definitely the case. Um, and uh, he is a member of the Defense Acquisition Corps with uh, certification and program management, uh, life cycle logistics, and business financial management. So a triple threat there as well. Uh, so Jim, Jim, uh, look forward to what you have to tell us about the uh, uh, OSD view of where we hope we can go. Great. Okay, I am uh, happy to be here and a bit humbled with uh, Andrew and Nick, and it's nice to see uh, past and current colleagues in the audience. What I want to talk to you about today is ONS costs and commonality. I spend an awful lot of time looking at the ONS costs for F-35 and other systems. Um, and my whole um, message here is really just to make us think. As we pursue any future systems, I contend that the data on our current systems can tell us an awful lot about where we might want to focus if we actually want to achieve reductions. Uh, my bottom line here is there's a ton of data out there, both actual and estimated data, both in government and industry for our current vertical lift aircraft. A lot of cost and performance data. We have to go grab it and look at it. The data can really help us inform strategies, concepts of operation, and it can really help us get to affordable readiness. When I say that, I mean that we achieve systems that meet our readiness requirements. These systems have to keep numbers of trained and ready crews available to the combatant commander, as simple as that. And they have to do it in a way that doesn't break the bank. So their sustainment costs cannot exceed what the services and the agencies can afford to, to spend. I think commonality, as Nick really touched on, is going to have some huge opportunities to acquire these systems. I think commonality is going to come with some political and operational benefits to operate and support these systems. I think we'll get a lot of backing, especially in the political area. And there are some potential cost reduction areas as well, too. Again, if we look at the data, and we're really smart about it. This chart is a typical cost Pareto using actual data for one of our current rotorcraft systems in the department. And um, this is by the CAPES cost estimating structure. Those are the categories labeled down in the bottom. And I just call your attention to the left side of the chart. This is typically where our rotor craft systems live in terms of the cost areas that make up their total ONS cost and how those things wow. queue out. So generally, depot level repair parts, uh, all categories of maintenance to include the manpower costs and the material costs associated with organizational, intermediate, depot level maintenance, um, and the energy costs are where our systems really, um, you know, it's where the spend really exists for our current systems. By the time you get to energy, you're upwards of, of about 90% of the spend. So a, a, a first look at some costs and a way to begin to focus in on what might we want to attack through commonality. Once we put a Pareto together, this chart takes that same cost data, and we just built a simple Excel rough order of magnitude cost model. That's all this is. And we take the cost categories, again, down to a second level. We plug in some costs that we actually experienced in 2014 on this system. And the real message here on this chart is the drivers. If you want to reduce costs on anything, if you want to focus strategies on things, you've got to come in on the cost drivers. I highlighted a couple and pointed them out. But really, the things that drive the cost in our systems are the numbers that we have to procure, you know, the number of aircraft in this case, the hours that we need them to operate per year, people costs, which are huge and a big inflation area, not only in DOD, but across the government. And then in terms of the burn rate and the cost per, uh, per gallon of jet fuel down on the bottom, that gets to our energy costs. If you want to reduce ONS costs, you've got to reduce the drivers. You've got to find a way to have these systems be 
uh, fewer, flying fewer hours, fewer people involved in lower energy costs. So what this chart does, again, it builds on the same data, takes it out of the model, and we rack the cost drivers, mm -hmm. the separate cost drivers and the, uh, the things that are driven by the numbers of aircraft, flying hours, people, and the energy costs. And we get to look at the sensitivity. What this chart does is it takes each one of those cost drivers and it increases it by 10%, and it shows you what the impact would be on total O&S cost. The same is true for reductions. Um, we call this a tornado chart when we draw out the reduction side because it looks like a profile of a tornado. Um, on the first line, I'll just walk you through an example here. So in our model, that particular aircraft had 148 in the aircraft. If we add 10% more aircraft to this model, 15 aircraft, we're going to have almost a one-for-one one increase in ONS cost, 9.8%. Same would be true for a reduction. If you found a way to do a mission through commonality that resulted in fewer aircraft, the numbers of aircraft, very, very large uh, impact on total ONS cost. Down towards the middle of the chart, what I highlighted is some areas where commonality really may have some, uh, some payoff. Again, Nick touched on this when he was talking about, um, on the acquisition side, developing common systems. If you can bring those into your sustainment con ops, and you can bring them um, away where those costs for the repair parts, the labor and material costs associated with those things are less, we have an opportunity to save some money there. Those are things we sh definitely should be doing in the acquisition and sustainment strategies. All of those areas that I point to, the depot level reparable cost per flight hour, the depot cost per aircraft, the consumable parts cost per flight hour, and the mod cost per aircraft are really part intensive areas. And again, if you could bring those uh, cost down by 10%, and you could aggregate somewhere around a 5 or 6% savings in that area, which is not insignificant. So really, I just want to reiterate the message of the last three charts. You've got to get to really understanding the drivers of cost. And each one of our current systems has got kind of a thumbprint, some rule of thumbs that you can look at to see what's going on there. Switch gears just a little bit here. And this chart is now showing you what might uh, be in the realm of the possible for mm -hmm. future systems based on what we achieved with a our couple of current, uh, legacy, uh, current systems that replace legacies. This is average uh, cost per flight hours now. And if you look at the two stack bars on the left part of the chart, uh, the one on the left is the legacy bird and the one next to it is the current system, it achieved a slight cost per flying hour reduction really interesting when you look at the data, and we haven't gotten into it a whole lot uh, other than to capture it, but there was a large reduction in maintenance costs, which is the green bar, and, and an increase in the manpower costs, mm -hmm. uh, and, a, and a, uh, also a slight increase in the ops cost. It'd be really interesting to get into that data and see what was going on. If you look at the two examples on the right-hand side, again, a legacy bird and a replacement aircraft, significant uh, cost per flying hour reduction was it actually achieved. This is actual data. Um, and it looks like maintenance-driven uh, costs was a significant reduction. And the continuing system improvement, or the mod costs, which is the blue on the top of that stack bar, came down a lot. Kind of indicative of newer systems, where you're modifying older ones to keep them going, and those mod costs go away um, early in the life of newer systems. Nick also touched on this, you know, if your airplanes are not, uh, if they're in maintenance, they're not up, they're not available to train and fight. Um, this is some other data that, that I pulled looking at the aircraft corrosion database, which happens to have uh, all the work order data for the current systems in it. So here's five systems, um, and it gives you an idea of where they're spending their time in terms of corrective and preventative maintenance. Uh, corrective maintenance has a real strong tie to reliability. Highly reliable systems will have less of that. Uh, preventative maintenance seems to get uh, a lot more into the maintenance system that we feel with the aircraft, how we design it for, um, you know, for maintenance in the field. Some of these systems you know, have 60-40 splits. Some of them are about half. Um, and, this, and the data that I pulled are systems that just kind of span the last couple of decades from some old systems to some new systems. Definitely an area to look in for commonality in terms of 
how much reliability is appropriate for these systems and what do we want to do for maintenance systems when we put them out there. Here's another view. Um, can't tell you what it's like to be in Bosnia on a cold winter day and pull a rotor head off an Apache and see standing water inside the rotor head with corrosion. Kind of makes your day interesting. Um, our aircraft spend an awful lot of time in corrosion correction type maintenance and there's a lot of cost driven there as well. There's a 20 to 30 percent opportunity mm -hmm. and we really, really have to get away from, uh, from this stuff in the system designs if at all possible. But there's also other ways of thinking about corrosion. Um, the Coast Guard manages their aircraft to be in and out of corrosion intensive areas. There's smart ways of, of going about doing this. Um, but there's a tremendous amount of um, potential here to reduce operating costs on future systems. And the last thing I'll look, again, from the work order database, five, five systems. Um, this comes down into the subsystem cost areas, and it just is showing you as a percentage of cost where things uh, typically reside. And for most of these kinds of systems, if you just walk down from the top, it's airframe, it's engines, it's, it's uh, rotor and drive type things. They've been our primary subsystem cost drivers for a long, long time. So I'm going to stop here, and again, my intent was just to put some data in front of you about our current systems and uh, begin to make us think a little bit about how we would go about focusing on areas where we might have some high payoff for cost reduction in the future. Thanks. That's great. Thanks, Jim, and uh, at least to this audience of one, you certainly know how to appeal to the audience because we love data here and uh, I love to see it. And what was really interesting to me was that your data gets directly at the question of what makes a difference? You know, what, what actually is going to make a difference in, at least in terms of cost? Um, and obviously there may be other difference makers in terms of operational effectiveness or um, ability to perform new missions, but. Uh, using data to really identify what makes a difference on the DOD side, marry that up with, uh, with the, what the potentially industry can bring to the table in terms of what's the art of the doable, what's the art of the achievable. Um, and you know, then it seems to me you start to really flesh out, okay, what do we want this program to be? Uh, and actually that's my, my first question to the two of you, uh, is the question of, um, you know, in this conversation back and forth between the department and industry, looking towards a future vertical lift program, a program in the future that hopefully will be an acquisition program and, and actually developing uh, new hardware, uh, what really makes a difference? What is, what is brought forth in that back and forth that, that, that you have seen um, that can help shape a future acquisition program? Nick, why don't you start? Yeah, I'll, I'll start off. <clears throat> I must say that uh, speaking for the industry representatives for the uh, Vertical Lift Consortium, uh, this is the first time that we've been at the bakery while the bread is being considered before it's even baked. Um, we find a, a great deal of commonality with our um, meetings with uh, the Council of Colonels and the Executive Steering Group that, that uh, teaches us what the customer's thinking about. Uh, in the past, that would often uh, concept the uh, formulation would often be done by small groups of engineers meeting with small groups of engineers, and not necessarily at the highest level. And we're finding out we we're uh, attached from the research end all the way up to the executive end, and it's giving us a much better insights into where the future systems are going. Um, I must say too that uh, we have tools, uh, industry has tools like ops analysis tools that can help and we are beginning to shadow the work that's being done by our customer and uh, help to duplicate the data in some cases, in some cases find differences that are worth uh, bringing into the conversation. So uh, I must say that this is, a, this is a, a formal method of getting us in fairly early and we feel very good about that. Well, what strikes me, you've mentioned the Council of Colonels uh, several times and what strikes me about that is it seems like it's a, and maybe you can let me know if I'm on the right track here, that it's a venue that uh, brings in that multi-service dialogue, but also I'm, I'm hoping brings in, you know, the requirements community in addition to the acquisition community, not just the industry side of the acquisition community, but the DOD side of the acquisition community, 
in that early dialogue, which is something that's long been a goal in, if you will, acquisition reform efforts, uh, but is you know, hard to point to instances necessarily where it's been done or done well. well. I certainly don't want to be speaking for the Council of Colonels directly, <laughs> and I would suggest that that might be a very good future topic, to have, understand the construction. But the, the, the system includes acquisition and user community very directly. So there's an attempt to pr produce practical results that are the results that will change what happens on the battlefield. Uh, Jim, I don't know if you've had a chance to go to any of those events uh, and see, you know, from you've you know, been obviously an operator and also uh, a longtime member of the acquisition community. Have you, what have you seen in terms of that interaction uh, between, the, between the sides? Yeah, I would agree with Nick that, um, you know, I often imagine if I could have been around, you know, a, a decade or so ago uh, around F-35. Yeah. And so we really have an opportunity in what the governance structure for FVL and, and our um, interaction with industry, I think, brings to the table is the opportunity to really be there. And not just when we're putting the bread in the oven, but, I mean, we're really thinking about the ingredients and a, and a whole bunch yeah. of other things. Um, for me, I, I keep going back to this term of affordable readiness. Um, Secretary Kendall talks about executable and affordable programs a lot. Um, but it, it's got a, it's, this interaction has a, a, a high probability, in my opinion, of resulting in a really great set of requirements. And I think the primary way to have an executable program and an affordable program in acquisition and ONS is to really get the requirement right. Scrub it to the bone, make sure it's the needs, get the wants out of it, and make sure we can clearly articulate that among the stakeholders and uh, industry so they're not guessing about what we're trying to do. Um, backing that up with some great strategies and some great contracts, and we're going to get the performance we need, and we're going to go about it in a way that we're not going to pay more than we should. And that's the thing that I think we really, really got to focus on and change as we go forward, um, if you consider the pressures that are on the fiscal environment right now. You know, it's uncertain is probably the best you can say about it. Um, but it's likely that we're going to have to do this at best with the resources we have today, and it could be something a whole lot less in the future. That takes me to my next question, which is, uh, you know, Jim, you've raised an excellent point about the budgetary pressures. And so I'm sure everyone in the room, uh, and part of their brain at least, comes into a discussion about future vertical lift and says, you know, is this going to happen in my lifetime? You know, do the res are the resources there to actually begin and execute a, an acquisition program uh, in this area towards a new capability? And uh, obviously, this dialogue on, on getting the requirements right is critical to determining the answer to that question. If the requirements are wrong, you can head and down a path that we've seen in some other programs that I won't individually name, but we can all think of our favorite candidate, where we went several years down a road and discovered uh, either midway or very late in the game that we were on an unaffordable path. And so uh, a generation was essentially skipped. We skipped a generation of technology, not in the good sense that we meant to, but in the sense that we, we didn't get there. We didn't get to a successful program. Um, and so I'm wondering, in, the, in terms of the dialogue that, that has taken place to date and what you see uh, coming up, uh, and I'll start with you, Nick, as to uh, is there something that has jumped out to you that, that, that this dialogue that you've learned, uh, let's say the government side, about what really mattered to them, about what they really saw as the potential benefit of a next generation system, what it was going to bring to the table that the yeah. current systems don't do or don't provide or don't do well enough. Um, that maybe before this dialogue began wasn't at the top of your mind, something that jumped out that you maybe weren't expecting. You know, to underscore what Jim was talking about, the idea that getting the requirements right is so very important to, to uh, starting this game. Uh, I must say that uh, industry came and responded to the requests for what the realm of the possible was with regard to uh, vertical lift machines in the future. And there's a realization that there's an increase in range that's probably between 50 and 100% and an increase in speed that's in, in that order of magnitude as well. Um, and in fact, that there's also a question of the future battlefields requiring that range and speed to allow the systems to function at all. Um, that leads us to a, a, a 
at least an intuitive conclusion that has to be proven as we start to, to run the ops analysis is that if we don't create these future systems, we're probably not going to be viable in that future battlefield. And I'm talking about that we're, we're the islands in the Pacific are that much farther apart, and today's helicopters with the given range and speed they have cannot effectively fight in those environments. Um, I must say then that the real question is not necessarily just affordability, which is always a question in our minds, but also whether you are preparing the warfighter to win in that future environment. And we have to be very careful that we don't end up with something where we are so carefully uh, 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 able to save money that we don't allow ourselves to win. And that, that really is the, is the crux of the discussion here. Um, the JMR tech demonstrators that are being built right now by two different teams that represent a, a, a wide swath of the, uh, of the vertical lift uh, industry um, are quite revolutionary in their behaviors in terms of speed, in terms of range, in terms of maintainability, in terms of the flying uh, agility that the machines possess. They are far and away better than any other vertical lift machines in the world. And those will fly in 2017. So the real question for us is that once we see that revolutionary behavior and understand how to harness it in the battlefield, how quickly can we get it into the warfighter's hands? Um, we think that the cost per pound for these machines will be no more than today's machines. So then the question is, do we invest and continue to invest in overhauling uh, today's systems, or do we invest in a future system at about the same cost that gives us this much more warfighting capability? Mm -hmm. And you're hearing, I, I, I represent one of the manufacturers of today's <laughs> systems. They're very, very capable systems. Uh, but uh, to imagine that they would also maintain that capability up through the 2030s is a, is a, is a tough, um, tough thing to imagine. Jim, you pre sort of preempted my question a little bit in your slides. You talked, because uh, I was going to ask you about uh, the capabilities that, that may be, have become apparent in this dialogue in industry uh, that, that can influence these decision makers. You, you really highlighted corrosion and the opportunities uh, to change, potentially change materials and uh, maybe make a significant difference in the amount of maintenance that uh, ends up having to occur and the amount of downtime that you end up uh, experiencing as a result of corrosion. Uh, I don't know if you have anything more to, <laughs> on, that, on that case that you could highlight a little bit about the opportunities to change the dynamic there. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and so I'll try to stay with my theme. Um, so if you look at corrosion and co corrosion-related maintenance cost, it's got a real um, uh, tight link with the number of maintainers per aircraft. Hmm. So that's going to be the driver. And, uh, you know, I, I date myself now, but I... I um, I look at the current systems um, to, to try to undate every now and then, but with what we're doing with the technologies, the constructions of the aircraft, the types of materials, but really that's the area to look at. How much, we know we don't want the aircraft to corrode, we know that we're going to be going into corrosive environments, so as an outcome we'd like to have the number of maintainers that we have to dedicate to corrosion related prevention and correction, inspections and all those kind of things to be minimal. From a design standpoint as well too, um, again, Black Hawk, Apache, uh, Kiowa Warrior, Chinook, kind of my, uh, my forte when I was flying. Um, the, um, you know, to have to do uh, cleaning and prevention and sealing and all those kind of things and await cure times. Cure times uh, for uh, corrosion and if any of these aircraft get uh, LO technologies, low observable type things put on them, is an incredible detractor, not only in the cost area, but it's a readiness impact while you're just simply waiting for things to dry and adhere and all those other kind of things. So um, we've got to think about the outcome. You know, Again, we want to have affordable readiness. That readiness definition has to be crystal clear to all of us. And you know, I, I, I'll tag onto a point that, uh, that Nick made that I really agree with, too. Um, this idea about requirements and affordability Another way of looking at it, and it's really the way the warfighter in the department looks at it, is priority. Uh, the same for F-35. Um, think what you will about where we are with that program. The warfighters want to go places with that system that they can't go with their current systems today, either because they're timed out or they're just not capable enough. And the rotorcraft vertical lift community is envisioning the same kind of things. They're being pulled to do things that they can't do with the current systems today. So we got to think about you know, what kind of readiness, what kind of capabilities um, is going to go along with that. Because my guess is the priority is going to stay high for that. 
And if the priority stays high, the department's going to find a way to do it. Jim, if I could add to um, the concept of uh, corrosion protection and corrosion cost folds right into that area that, that I mentioned that our, our team felt was very important, and that is cataloging and controlling the total life cycle cost. That, that if you don't do that, then you end up with the trades with, uh, with magnesium gearboxes which save weight and which uh, can be made for a given nickel. And then when they get in the field, they cost a lot more to maintain because of the corrosion uh, probabilities of those materials. Um, if we ch spend the money up front and, and readjust the design for life cycle costs, we find ourselves making decisions that have great benefits into the longer future. They trade other ways, that perhaps they have a little bit more weight spent on that system, and therefore some other system has to be larger, larger engines or different rotor systems or wings to support the machine. But those trades can be made so that the long life cycle uh, cost is dropped. Um, I'll offer the tools exist. Um, I was the program manager of one machine uh, that uh, required all the designers to catalog not just the weight of every part, which is part of the CATIA database, and there's actually a screen that totals the weight for every print that's being released. And there's another one for the initial cost that is on everyone's tool set today. We added a third screen, which was the maintenance burden. Now, we told, chose to catalog it in terms of maintenance cost per hour, literally, but it ends up becoming life cycle cost. Um, and that screen was part of the design decision making for that machine. Interestingly, that machine now is, is changing the way operators operate, um, and the typical machine in the field is pushing 2,000 revenue hours a year in a helicopter, and the high time last year for that particular machine was 2,300 hours in Norway. And if you could picture the operating environment, there's no way you could assign to that some degree of, uh, you know, it's, it's a simple, easy uh, atmosphere and, and so on. So it, you get what you ask for in the requirement stage. And if the requirement is to drive life, life cycle costs, uh, we in industry think we have the tools to help truly control that and deliver it. I'm going to uh, open up one more area of discussion before turning to our uh, audience. This is a very distinguished group here with a lot more knowledge than I have, so I want to get to your questions uh, soon. But, but before I do that, I wanted to uh, get at one other issue, which Nick, you really raised on your slides, was this issue of commonality and what commonality could potentially bring to uh, vertical lift uh, and that there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, and I, I always like to think of things in terms of examples and in commonality there's some, as I mentioned, as in all of acquisition, there's some good examples, maybe some less successful examples. The one that always stands out for me um, that uh, has shown a lot of success is uh, and it's a little bit ironic. And, well, uh, mostly we come to these events and we, we bash mil specs. We talk about how bad mil specs were and how we got to get away from them. And in some cases that may well be true, but there is the mil spec, the mil standard 1760 for the interface between aircraft and, and the stores and carriage. Uh, that's really been, you know, it's interesting to me that as we've gone through my 20 years following the acquisition system, uh, that standard has held up through the entire time. It has been something that uh, has, uh, has definitely stood the test of time as a design. And uh, so I just was hoping that you could talk a little bit about where you think some of the high payoffs or what difference makers commonality really could bring to the table. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that because I, I do know that the 14 inch standard NATO rack is just a great thing to have and everything fits on it because everyone designs to it. Um, I think the commonality has a number of aspects that, that save um, the one that I would lean on most, uh, because it's the most apparent immediately, is the time it takes to develop the total system from an acquisition standpoint. If we have, uh, for example, um, specified that everyone would use the same generator control logic, and I just offer that as a, a, a part nobody ever talks about. But if you, if you think about the idea that they're already developed, that the boards are developed, they may be larger contactors that have much greater uh, um, current flow, but the fundamental control of the system is not in doubt. And maybe the same system would be used uh, everywhere. And that way, you didn't have to spend the time it takes to develop that for your product and another product and another product. Um, the same thing with the cockpits, as I mentioned. The same thing with the maintenance uh, uh, and logistics environment. The same thing with training simulators. If, if you could picture that uh, five capability sets were supported with one of those programs for each of those major areas, then you would collapse that share of the program. It might only be 10 or 15 percent of the total procurement dollar for the for the for the development of that uh, of that system, but that's 10 or 15 percent you didn't spend five times over. Hmm. So you ended up, I think, with a large savings there. 
And then on the other side of it, I think Jimmy had some data to show that, that once you had relatively common, and I must tell you, it's the difference between identicality and commonality. Identicality to me is exactly the same part, and that is an obvious savings. But there's commonality in that the crews know how to behave because even though it's a different part by dash number, it behaves about the same way. So you don't spend three more hours trying to figure out if that's the one that broke. And there's an amazing uh, um, uh, payoff for commonality that is not identical, but close enough that the system behaves because it understands that area. So I believe that it has both acquisition and it has uh, development cost, I should say, um, acquisition cost and life cycle cost advantages to having that commonality. Jim, lessons learned on commonality. You've, you've uh, had some experience in this field. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. There's also, and, and Nick acknowledges in his presentation, some uh, possible downsides. What do you think is the uh, kind of the key factors to making sure that commonality ends up being a net benefit? Uh, towards an effort like this. Yeah, so in addition to the designs, and, and you know, I would defer to, to Nick on those kinds of things, um, one of the things that I really think has to get going uh, soon in FVL is a definition of the concepts of operation. And I think we really need to, again, draw that future picture of how we think some of the potential high payoff things are actually going to work. What do we envision for training? Everyone goes to the same school. Uh, they can be initially trained, certified, and sustained throughout their life cycle. Um, what do we think about uh, sustainment? You know, is a uh, Navy you know, vertical lift system going to touch down at an Army base and get everything it needs? Is the information technology system going to recognize a different mechanic from a different unit touching that jet? I mean, there's a lot of things that we really need to work through. I think without concepts of operations that are different today, we're likely to produce some systems that may have common designs. We can leverage them perhaps in, you know, to an extent in operations and support, but it's not going to go far enough. Um, F-35, for example, um, you know, in the memorandums that chartered that program between the, the DOD and the MODs of the world, those that are involved in the cooperative development had an idea of using a common spares pool. So rather than sparing each service in each nation, um, the, um, the entire global fleet would benefit from the right stuff in the right places, uh, being repaired to common standards and being available for, uh, for anybody's use based on the priority and the urgency of need. But let me tell you, that a lesson learned from that is it is, uh, you know, the idea is easy to grasp. Pulling it off mm. so that a left main landing gear can come off a Turkish jet, be repaired in Norway, and go on an Air Force jet you know, at uh, Luke is, uh, is something that really takes a lot of work in terms of QA and QC and uh, supply and maintenance and transportation standards. But um, I think without a CONOP, I think without, you know, um, really employing ourselves and the requirement sponsors to really think about, well, how do you, how do you want to operate these things that's different than today? And I would just mention, too, um, you know, I have an opinion but uh, I think the political benefits are something that we have to grab. I think the sense of the Congress is they probably want us to cooperate and collaborate on these future systems. And I think they believe that um, a cooperative development of things that we can share in the technologies and the capabilities is going to cost less and be better for the country. So we can't, we can't miss that piece of it as well, too. It's a little bit squishier, but that's just my opinion. Well, I want to open up now to audience questions. Uh, and uh, I always like to start with someone on the front row. So, uh, <laughs> Sydney, why don't we start with you? <laughs> uh, microphone coming your way, Sydney. Much louder now. Sydney Friedberg, Breaking Defense. Uh, first, a question about commonality. You know, well, obviously we have the F-35's model, which was to build three variants of the same aircraft. And how common they are today relative to the goals is perhaps disappointing. But you know, you at, on FBL are proposing to have you know multiple programs, and then you would say sounds like one sort of commonality program almost that serves the others, that provides things like here is your cockpit, or you know here is your your gearbox, or at least the components for those. How would you envision that working? Because I don't think it's a model I've seen on any defense program. It's fascinating, but I don't know how it would work. 
I agree, and I'm not sure that I can tell you exactly how it would work either. It is, we're, we're really stating what we think would be, and I'll use the word con ops, um, to describe the, the concept. Uh, and please recognize that where you have F-35 or three aircraft of uh, quite similar uh, general layouts and capabilities, here we're talking about future vertical lift, which could have as many as five different capability sets. And within each capability set, there might even be one or two models of machine. So it, it spreads it uh, and, and, and raises even more questions because it's am among so many different airframes. Uh, nonetheless, the idea that there would be a uh, program that would produce the fundamentals for the cockpit or a program that would produce the fundamentals for the maintenance and logistics systems, including diagnostics and, and, uh, and so on, uh, and the training of the crews, those programs would deliver their products down, we picture, to the, to the uh, program that actually developed the air vehicle. And the air vehicle would see this as being a piece of furnished equipment that came from another source. Um, to fine tune it though, the program that produces the cockpit has to have representation from each of the constituent members so that there are enough hooks in that cockpit to support the equipment that each of the aircraft would use. You can't simply build a blind alley and ask them to then redevelop the system where I think you lose all the benefits that we're describing. And I would have to point out that uh, if you look at today's uh, computer systems, you see uh, the kinds of things I'm describing in, in great length. The, uh, the Mac that you've got there, you can go down to the Apple store and buy um, uh, aftermarket uh, changes, vast changes, that change the, the capabilities of the system and turn into a scientific computer or a publishing computer uh, where the core itself is a, is a common system. So I think that we have around us examples like this. Um, and I think that it, it, the, the trick for us to do is to recognize that the systems that we build, the flight systems, might take a small reduction in their, um, uh, in their efficiency, in their payload efficiency, <laughs> but accept a large increase in the economic advantage of developing that system because these, these um, um, features that are provided to it are already provided uh, and the program doesn't have to pay to develop them. I hope that gives you a little bit more clarity. Well, in the end, I think the taxpayer. But as a, as a point of uh, fact, it would, it would, we would picture the structure might be that there would be a future vertical lift program that might be at the service level or it could be at the DOD level, and that program would then marshal the programs under it. There would be larger programs for the features I mentioned, and then underneath that would be those that develop the air vehicles. And just as an air vehicle now doesn't develop an engine, the engine is delivered usually through a customer system and is called government furnished equipment, uh, very possibly that we would find that kind of furnished equipment provided to the lowest level programs, the ones that actually are produced in air vehicles. And they would be administered through perhaps a DOD, but perhaps it would be by a master service that was expert in that particular field. I offer today uh, the FACE Consortium is developing software this way, and I believe the Navy has got the lead in FACE Consortium, but the Army's carefully following it as well. And that might serve as a small example of what I'm describing. It almost sounds to me a little bit like taking the open systems architecture concept, which is generally applied at the platform level and applying it at the multi-platform level or cross-platform to some degree. And I think that has, that has relevance, yes. Come over here. Good morning, Otto Kreitz for Sea Power Magazine. Focus on commonality. The Army has said, you know, there's been some proposals that we're going to have maybe one system that can be in different size, you know, an attack, a utility, or, or some, you know, similar aircraft, different sizes, different capabilities. The Army has says they indicated they want two different systems, and they don't want to, you know. One, you know, one that you can stretch to do, do two different things. How would that affect the, the, your commonality drive? I'll, I'll jump in a little bit. Uh, I haven't heard precisely those words. I believe that the requirements for the capability sets are still being understood. And I believe there's pretty good concurrence among the services for what the, uh, the fundamental properties of those capability sets are. Um, I would love to have one of the representatives um, when the time is right, discussing the details for each of those systems. I don't believe that the, uh, uh, the blanket's been shaken quite enough to, to know uh, the details for the systems. 
Yeah, I, I think my, uh, my we, as I mentioned, this is uh, going to continue to be a series of events. And so I think uh, we are hoping that at a future date when folks are ready to come talk a little more detail about what these efforts uh, advancing towards formulating a requirement uh, and coming out of the dialogue between DO and industry uh, as they get to a point of maturity where they're ready to talk about some conclusions as opposed to um, some of the inputs. I, we're hoping to have an event on that in the future. And maybe just to add a comment, I, I believe that there are some examples out there today. Um, I would offer as one of the positive examples for commonality is the, uh, is the uh, H1 series for the U.S. Marine Corps. Having enforced to a great degree the differences between an attack and a utility machine, but the similarities, I am told that there's about an 80% parts commonality between the two aircraft, even though they're dramatically different fundamental airframe uh, appearances. And, and that has great benefit for the shipboard parts storage and training of crews and maintainers. And that might serve as a small model of what we're describing to a much larger uh, degree. Uh, I'd also point out that the Boeing fleet has common cockpit elements so that pilots who are qualified in one Boeing model can climb into another one, and the FAA says they're legal to fly it. And, and those are examples of this kind of commonality that we think we might be able to achieve at least for the fundamental air vehicle, if not its mission systems, um, so that we didn't have to repeat the process of developing every single multifunction display for every single capability set aircraft. And I hope that gives you some picture of at least where things stand today. Hi, George Nicholson, a special operations consultant. Several years ago when Gene Taylor, Congressman Gene Taylor was chairman of the Sea Power Subcommittee, and his keynote speech at the Surface Navy Association, he said, as much as we're paying for an aircraft right now, as much as we're paying for a ship right now, it's going to have to last 20 to 30 years, we have to have a built-in growth capability. So it comes before my committee, and even though he's still not there, I'm going to ask that question. Two days later, in a discussion with the PEO ships and his three-star boss, I asked that question and said, you don't understand, we don't worry about objectives and a requirement. All we're worrying about is building the thresholds. How do you look at this growth capability being built in, into, this, in this, into this initiative? I guess that's my question. <laughs> Thank you for the softball question. <laughs> it, it is always a challenge, and I, I am um, at heart an engineer who thinks of the design, and we always have the design tools to be able to design exactly to the edge. And of course, when we do that and build no growth into the system, we have optimal payload, optimal range, optimal capability for today's system, but no growth. Um, the growth that occurs on today's systems occurs mostly because our tools aren't accurate enough and so that we learn the greater capability of the system as we exercise it and squeeze the next 10 or 15% out of it. Uh, that wasn't true in the earlier days. There was so much margin because there were so many overages built in um, that we had that advantage. I would only argue back this. If you want growth in the system, that is capability you are not using for the first 10 years of its life. The area under the curve of the stuff you didn't carry for those 10 years is how you're paying for increase in the capability after 10 years. So the real question is, where do you want to pay for it? Later when you modify the system to create the capability, or by telling the warfighter, no, you can't carry eight missiles, you can only carry four. Even though we have four more built into the airplane, we're not lucky to use it yet because it isn't 10 years yet. And, and that is how a designer sees that question. So forgive me. Just uh, briefly before we go to the next question, uh, a thought occurred to me is that kind of getting at the question that was asked about if you've got uh, commonality, you've got a lot of people working together uh, in a diversity of areas, maybe different companies, who's in charge or who's managing this? And the thought that occurred to me is that's obviously an important question in the design phase, uh, who controls the design and those criteria, but it's also an important consideration in the ONS phase, which ultimately is the far greater uh, amount of time for any platform. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know this question is right now being wrestled with on the F-35, the issue of how do you structure who's in charge of bringing together the various elements of that maintenance supply chain uh, and the product support manager and the product support integrator. And Jim, I just thought maybe if you could give us a little bit of insights or lessons from how F-35 is wrestling with this question of a huge diversity of suppliers, international, inclusive, uh, and who kind of is in control and who is 
you know, managing that decision-making process. Yeah, so right now there's a, um, I like to call it a sustainment baseline. So there's 123 jets flying in the country today, plus a test fleet, um, all three U.S. services, plus the U.K., Australia, jets are coming on all the time. And, um, um, and so there's, a, there's you know, an existing strategy that's taking care of those aircraft today. But again, it, it gets back to um, you know, a question of policy and requirements and looking at uh, making affordable decisions over the life cycle for F-35. There's still a bit of work to be done, quite a significant amount of work really to be done, and, and it's in the middle. Um, it'll, you know, the government responsibility is on the top of the sustainment strategy, if you will, the product support manager's roles and responsibilities, and that entity's team, that person's team, are pretty much laid out in statute develop a strategy, make it cost effective, study it, you know, morph it throughout the life cycle to meet the requirements and keep it affordable. On the provider end, uh, laws, law drives some of the workload, for example, core depot maintenance workload into the organic base in the US, where the, or, where the workload exists today for the systems that are gonna be replaced, Harrier, F-16, uh, A-10, those kinds of systems. Um, and there's sovereign requirements from all of the international partners. They also have industrial capabilities and they um, believe that that's benefits that they, they get and they've earned as part of being the development for the system. It's really about in the middle um, and it's deciding, um, it's obviously a massive integration requirement to do that correctly uh, and to take the resources and to um, best utilize the training providers and the maintenance and supply chain providers in a way that, is, again, is going to maximize that affordable readiness for the system over the life cycle. And that is something that really the department is, is going to kind of wrestle out with the program office and the participants over the next really couple of years. Um, what's the right mix of industry in that role? And there will be a large one. I mean, the, the, the way we acquire these systems, we're going to have a relationship with industry for them for a lifetime a lot of how we sustain them and a lot of what we face for commonality is sustaining that commonality throughout the life cycle. Uh, they develop the systems and we're gonna need them you know, in partnership throughout the life cycle. So um, it's undecided right now for, uh, for F-35, um, but the, uh, you know, the initial strategy has, has uh, the government, Lockheed, Pratt & Whitney, BAE Systems, it's got Rolls-Royce involvement. Um, and it's really got um, you know, a lot of uh, warfighter play in it as well too, directly into that integration role to help keep everybody focused in on the requirements. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the microphone's coming your way. Right. Yeah. Samuel Bell, Stark Aerospace. Could you address how you plan to integrate unmanned capabilities in the future since in 15, 20 years, Quite a lot of the benign, more benign missions could be performed on men and would have a great impact on cost. I think you're looking at, and I appreciate the question, for a detailed answer. Um, we recognize that uh, the IOC that we're talking about is quite a good day, a way off, um, but the program has a timeline associated with the development of the details for the, the, the FPL uh, platforms um, that probably involve uh, um, uh, having reasonable design understandings in about five years. I must say that a great deal of what we see in terms of reliability and maintainability uh, as applied to the field is going to occur with regard to the design that makes it uh, more predictable uh, for the life of components and uh, easier to change the components, but also will result in the data from the aircraft and its systems, usage monitoring systems, for example, that allow us to predict usage and allow to predict spares uh, um, allocations uh, on the fly as we learn by a system that is not only able to tell us what it's doing, but also then predict what will happen in the future. I think that there, there's a, a revolution occurring in the maintainability field today that has to do with the understanding of the data that we gather. Uh, I know that at least one of the model helicopters that I'm deeply familiar with is producing about one gig of data per hour per aircraft flying. And that is an enormous wealth of information. And I think I'm, I'm trying to answer your question and indicate that most of what we're going to do is the traditional attack on the life of components, but some of it's going to be an attack on how we then spares provide and how we predict so that the aircraft tells us the part needs changing before it fails. 
the most important way to get the life cycle costs down is to produce a predictable system whose maintenance occurs when it's not needed and not when it is needed. And the horror of having, uh, as a unit commander, to stand there and have eight aircraft on the flight line supposed to fly and one of them is not serviceable means you have to say to your boss which missions you're not going to fly. And I think that that's one of the ways that we're going to answer that question is by having enough data and a system sensitive to it to be able to predict and to allocate the manpower appropriate to changing parts before they break. Dick Benatta from Institute for Defense Analyses, and there's several questions one could ask, but we don't have that much time, I guess. But the first thing I'm curious about in terms of this acquisition strategy and trying to reach these goals of 50 percent or 100 percent uh, better uh, distance and speed is what's the role of the JMR? I know they're not supposed to be prototypes, uh, but we're trying to get acquisition speed built into this. How do we make these things useful in terms of reducing the acquisition and the value of these systems in terms of actually achieving those kinds of goals. I can feel that one if you want. Thank you. Jim, do you hear me? I, I, I am intimately aware of at least one of the team's um, uh, responses to the government's request for building that tech demonstrator for JMR. And while we recognize the JMR tech demonstrators are technology demonstrators that are only loosely associated with FEL, and I recognize our customers wish to be sure to recognize that the concepts are still being formulated uh, for FEL, but the JMR represents those high technologies that are buildable today that might be applicable. Uh, and I must tell you, one of the great lessons is to watch the teams building the machines. I, I sit on the board for one of them, and I must tell you that the government engineers are next to me as we are judging the preliminary design or critical design review for the machine. And unlike in the past, where these reports were all buttoned up and mailed off to a command somewhere else to be reviewed at their leisure, we have government people sitting on the demonstrator teams making real-time decisions in days, not in weeks or months. And that's, in fact, I think one of the lessons learned for how this future acquisition might streamline itself is by having concurrent teams that work together to make decisions fairly quickly and have empowered teams from both the contractors and the government side that can make decisions that stick um, without relying on long uh, bureaucratic uh, time delays. So I think that's one of the lessons we're learning, and I, I think that's might have been where you were going with some of your questions. If that does prove to be successful and these machines fly well, it is very possible that the government might want to take some of that lesson learned from the way a program is conducted and weave that into the full-scale development of the FVL birds. Jim, I, uh, your charts, you had some data about legacy platforms and then the next generation platform that replaced it and showed that in some cases a big difference in maintenance cost, other cases less so. I'm just wondering if in your experience, because I'm gonna just try to uh, uh, jump you a little bit here, because uh, uh, I know your current mission may not lend you towards thinking hard about what's the role of a technology demonstrator in the acquisition process, uh, but, but you have been in this game for a while. So I'm just wondering if you have thoughts about uh, not necessarily what this, you know, not speaking to what the Army is specifically trying to achieve with uh, the JMR technology demonstrations, but generally where, where technology demonstrations have helped feed the acquisition process uh, and, and either reduced risk or brought lessons learned, process lessons or other lessons uh, that help the program um, in the future. Yeah, so the, the acquisition IPT and the um, common systems IPT are really wrestling with this now with the services and um, and with OSD, quite frankly, to come up with what's the program structure, what's the appropriate level on this idea of commonality, uh, and what's going to be that executable and affordable acquisition strategy. So I won't speak to that. But uh, my thoughts to your question really are, is about content, and then having the guts to let that content stay with the tech demonstrators. If we're interested in just demonstrating move, shoot, and communicate capabilities, that's fine. If you want to demonstrate the ability to sustain these things and um, you know, maybe give some insight into what the concepts of operation could be for training and maintenance and supply ops and things like that, 
less sexy, but things that might have some real high payoff later in the life cycle, I would say let's do that and let's have the guts not to trade that off as we need to you know, uh, mm -hmm. squeeze the soccer ball other mm -hmm. places. Mm -hmm. I have a question over here. Hi, Megan Eckstein with USNI News. Uh, since F-35 has come up in conversation a few times, I was wondering if that program has provided any lessons learned for you guys in the early stages just on how to organize the program or how to, um, you know, what level of commonality you'd like to push for or anything? Yeah, again, uh, I'm not going to speak for the acquisition IPT and the common systems IPT. They're really, really wrestling with that stuff now to, to come up with that. Um, you know, F-35 is a highly common system. I mean, they, they share a lot of uh, components for a single engine jet to share the core engine. Uh, that's going to be a pretty good thing. Engines tend to be cost and readiness drivers over the life cycle. And Nick mentioned the possibility of bringing <coughs> GFE engines that are plug and play into these aircraft with common look and feel on the operations and maintenance side. It's those kinds of things. The, again, the lesson learned, and this has really formed my opinion about FVL, is on the CONOPS. I hate to keep going back there, but it's okay to say commonality. If we took a little test right now and passed out three by five cards and everyone wrote down a definition, we'd write something different down. I know we would. But to really think and, and, and have it be a requirements-based, operational-based kind of a thing, what do we want to do with these systems that's different? Um, and uh, I think it was the 7.5 and the 7.6, not only do you get the same type rating, but the simulators were so high fidelity. You could actually uh, you know, be rated to go out and fly in revenue service never having flown in the aircraft. I mean, it's just take, take these ideas further uh, and maybe industry and, and commercial offers some ideas about how we could be thinking. Really look at what we've done the last 12 years and where we think we're going in the future. Um, but F-35 for me really, I, I think it just, it, it sparks the idea that we really have some work to do with the CONOPS. I end up with something that's common, how do I really want to use it to extract the operational benefits out of it? And you got to think about that early or you're not going to hit those goals. In the back. Brad Peniston with Defense One. Uh, I get your point about CONOPS, but as they say, predicting is difficult, especially with the future. And <laughs> is it even possible to know how you're going to want to use these things? I mean, everything from you know, the Black Hawk to aircraft carriers gets used differently than how people thought it was. How do you even set up a process that allows you to come to, to requirements that will actually be borne out? Let me try that one first. Yeah, go ahead, try. Nick. Help me. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a different word than CONOPS, only to try and explain what I think that Jim and I would, would probably agree to. The concept of operations of the future is actually the vision of how the system will be used. So rather than predicting what the system will do in the future, it's commanding the system to have to do it because you stated the vision. And I think it inverts the paradigm. Then once the system is created, the CONOPS adjusts to what is actually deliverable. But one hopes that you've achieved a significant percentage of those deliverable changes to today's systems of that future vision that you now change the game. In the end, it is the game changing that we're all interested in. And, and I think that if you look at the tech demonstrators as an illustration of the physical side of this, the air vehicle itself, and I don't want to dwell on just air vehicle because there's so much more. If you think about the, the tremendous advantages that future controls, that future uh, protection gear, that future weapon systems will have when hung onto this aircraft. Um, it gives you a tremendous picture of what that future battle will be like. And I think the CONOPS we're talking about is how do you want the battle to run? Uh, let's face it, our, our uh, warfighters came and set a series of properties for the future system. FVL um, strategic plan contains a table of the number of things that the warfighters asked for. And by the way, number one on the table was maintainability and reliability interestingly, but then also came speed and range mm -hmm. uh, and payload and high altitude and, and many, many other uh, uh, properties, all of them prioritized. Those set then the future vision. 
So instead of CONOPS, if we were to say the vision of how the system would fight, and then we design a system underneath that vision to get as close as we can, I think that's probably what we're talking about. And I hope that answers your question. Well, I think the issue you've highlighted, it seems to me, is, uh, is actually a problem that FBL is wrestling with, but it's a problem the whole department is wrestling with, because it's fundamentally the same issue that the Defense Innovation Initiative raises, which is that's an effort to uh, envision where technology both, number one, will go, and number two, can take us. And they're almost sure to get it to some extent wrong. But uh, by the same token, uh, the demonstration, the last, if you will, technology offset strategy of the 1970s envisioned that GPS and, um, and the uh, increased broadband communications were going to fundamentally change how uh, war fighting could be done, and they were right. They probably had it wrong as to what they exactly thought that was going to do. But the fact that those fundamental, uh, the vision for how that could fundamentally change things was accurate, uh, mm -hmm. and they didn't necessarily need to know all the whys and wherefores of what it would mean operationally day to day on the battlefield, but they understood that it was a difference maker. Uh, and I think that's what, to my mind, the Defense and Innovation Initiative is hoping to deliver and hopefully will deliver, and that's writ large across the department and you can think of it, I think, also writ small in terms of future vertical lift mm -hmm. and the difference makers uh, that may be there in that technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only thing that, um, just by way of example, um, there's, a, there's an operational aspect of this, too. The, you know, the, the field figures things out. Um, uh, you know, just a watershed for me was during the Cold War going from the Cobra to the Apache. And it didn't take more than the first uh, checkout flight in the Apache to figure out the thing for me was survival. I all of a sudden realized that all the stuff that I had been practicing to do in Europe in the Cobra, I'm actually going to be able to do it now and survive. I'll come back and I'll be able to do it you know, with impunity. I think V-22 um, is going through some of that right now. I mean, there was a capability set. You built a fantastic machine. Um, but uh, 40 nautical miles for a fully loaded UH-1 November combat radius right, in the AOR, and look at what the V-22 is doing today. That community hasn't figured it out yet. Um, and so maybe it's back to the whole thing of balance. You know, we, we'll, we'll try to envision what the world looks like in the future. We're probably going to be wrong at any point in time. Um, but uh, the field will, will use the capability that we give them, and they'll, and they'll improve their mission sets. It naturally happens. It's always happened in the DOD. I'm going to uh, exercise my think tank didactic role for one more second just to say that, you know, I think that vision's always there. Whether you're explicit about what your vision is uh, is one question, but you have to have some sort of vision when you're mapping out a, a new system. Uh, there's going to be a vision implied, if not one that's expressed. Yeah. So I think yeah. expressing it is a good thing to do because, again, it gets back to that early fundamental dialogue about what are the what are the desires, what are the priorities, what are the expectations. Yeah. Make that as explicit as possible, as early as possible in the acquisition system. That's one of the things I like about the approach that's being taken yeah. here. And, and Jim's point that CONOPS is actually a multifaceted question. If you think of CONOPS as a book, the book has many chapters. One of them is the concept of the maintenance, another is the concept of the war fighting of the vehicle itself, and another one is the concept of how the program runs and operates. Another one is the concept of how a unit is, is, is amassed to put this vehicle to use. All of those things change as you change through the vehicle, and each one of them is a separate chapter. I think we have time for one more question, and there's one hand up, so we'll, we'll give a twofer here. <laughs> So um, I've got a couple of uh, helo pilots up here. I'm sitting next to one over here. And I haven't heard anything about unmanned versus manned mm -hmm. relative to the concepts and the kinds of issues that are involved in terms of savings, in terms of pilots and costs, uh, and con ops and kinds of missions. You mentioned one in particular where you were saying, talking about this as a resupply capability, uh, why would that be a manned system, uh, et cetera. So is that being considered within the concept of the future vertical lift? I, the answer is a resounding yes, and unfortunately our charter today was to talk about one part of the elephant, and we happen to have the tail in our hand, and you're talking about another part of the elephant, a very big one. And certainly that is being discussed among all of the, uh, the user community and the acquisition community as to exactly how that fits into the con, con ops. 
uh, we see a revolution taking place right now? And the answer is yes. The only thing I would add on the cost is, again, go back to the kind of academic side of my presentation today. You really got to kind of look at the systems and see what they're telling you. I mean, a Global Hawk and a U2 do a lot of the same things. Um, they're wildly different in their operational uh, context, and they can have wildly different uh, cost scenarios. You definitely get to pull the cost of the, you know, the soldier or the airman, the marine, the coast guard. You get to pull them out, but then you need to really just look at the cost model for the system. You know, some of our intel systems have got scores of people grabbing those gigs of data that come down every hour from, you know, uh, reapers and gray eagles, and um, there are questions that you can answer. Um, but it's, it's nice to start with some data about your current systems and what you think you're going to do with it. Mm -hmm. well, it's an interesting point. I, don't, I heard an Air Force official who said, you know, the manpower cost of unmanned systems is killing us. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's definitely a balance there. Uh, and I think some, obviously, some are better than others. And that's where that early dialogue uh, is important. Well, thank you very much. It's been a very attentive audience and a very well informed one. And uh, hopefully, you've got your money's worth today. Uh, we will, as I mentioned, have uh, an, uh, additional events on this topic, getting, uh, trying to advance the conversation towards uh, as the AIPT and the work of, uh, at the department uh, grows more mature. So uh, keep your eyes peeled for that. And uh, please uh, thank our panelists for their great work today. <laughs>